All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is Philly Socialist. We are hosting an event uh, with Dr. Peter Cole, Ben Fletcher, and the Multiracial Union Organizing in Philadelphia. So while folks are still trickling in, um, we are going to do a quick little icebreaker game, just something uh, fun to, uh, to start out. Um, before we get into talking about uh, a very notable proletariat organizer, um, let's uh, do something to visit some other uh, notable proletariats, organizers, revolutionaries throughout the ages, just to test your knowledge. So feel free to uh, comment your uh, thoughts, your guesses for who the proletariat is. We are going to be doing... Who's that proletariat? So let's see. We'll start out. Okay, number one, first proletariat. Let's see how clever you are. Voluntarily worked manual labor jobs while simultaneously doing administrative work to run the country, reportedly working for as much as 36 hours at a time. And remember, comment uh, who you think it is before we do the reveal. Next. Excelled in football, rugby, swimming, golf, and guerrilla warfare, despite acute asthma. Fought for revolution in Cuba, Bolivia, and Congo. And then finally, for the big reveal, Che Guevara. So if you guessed Che Guevara, congratulations, you're correct. Let's go on to revolutionary proletariat number two. All right, let's see. A motorcyclist himself, he formed an all-women motorcycle personal guard. He planted over 10 million trees to present, prevent desertification and vaccinated 2.5 million children against meningitis, yellow fever, and measles in a matter of weeks. And it is Thomas Sankara. If that was your guess, congratulations. Keep on guessing, keep on generating those guesses. Number three, stood barely five feet tall. Already involved with revolutionary political movements by her first year in high school and helped found the Spartacus League, which grew into the Communist Party of Germany. If you guessed Rosa Luxemburg, you are correct. And our fourth and final proletariat, revolutionary, organizer, influential thinker. We've got number one, died on the day before Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. The first black American to earn a PhD from Harvard University. Co-funded the NAACP. It's W.E.B. Du Bois. And that's what we've got for today. We will go back uh, to start off with Dr. Peter Cole to introduce our topic for today and discuss another very important organizer, uh, Ben Fletcher. So you can come on now, Peter. Thanks for joining us today and uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Ezra, for introducing me and for everyone in the Philly Socialists for being um, excited about my 
work. And I'm thrilled also for everyone in the audience for being a part of it. Um, I uh, have a slideshow that I think that my partner in crime, Caitlin, will be presenting. And I'm going to have to actually tell her as I go to advance slides. I apologize for that. Um, but nevertheless, here we go. So Ben Fletcher, pictured here and on the cover of my recent book, was the most important leader of the IWW's most effective interracial union, which controlled the Philadelphia waterfront for a decade through its militancy and direct action tactics. Fletcher is one of the most important black figures in US labor history, yet very few people, even on the left, know his name. So if Ezra was giving that sort of little icebreaker game to people, say last week or in some other place, no one would guess Ben Fletcher. Um, yet I'm suggesting to you, and I hope you'll agree um, after you hear me present for a little while, um, that he couldn't be more relevant to the political projects of our time. Uh, next slide, please. So I place Ben Fletcher squarely at the center of worker organizing in the early 20th century. And that meant that uh, he had to reckon with the ever intertwined dynamics of race and class, not to mention the potentials and the limitations of direct action versus bread and butter unionism in an interracial and then later predominantly black labor union. Um, um, I believe that Fletcher um, not only unsettles US labor history, but also the histories of American radicalism, of black studies. Um, Fletcher is um, really sort of the greatest black wobbly there ever was, but he also sort of um, is even bigger than the IWW in um, perhaps, um, I do appreciate very much that in our times, in, in the 21st century, racial capitalism is alive and well. Um, in the, the time period that Fletcher was most influential, the 19 teens, extreme racism and xenophobia, as well as incredible inequality were the norm, right? Um, and so um, just like we sort of are struggling with these issues in our time, arguably what Fletcher and the union that he led on the Philadelphia waterfront was grappling with the exact same issues, perhaps even in uh, sort of greater, uh, greater extremes. Next slide, please. So, Ben Fletcher was uh, born and raised in Philadelphia, um, right in the heart of the city of Philadelphia. He was born in 1890, um, and his parents had moved to Philadelphia um, from the state of Virginia, probably in the 1880s, the late 1880s, although it's not um, entirely clear um, why his parents chose to leave their home place of Virginia for Philadelphia is also not certain. Um, but it's reasonable to conclude that in the aftermath of the sort of um, counter revolution, the end of Reconstruction in the 1880s, that uh, with the rise of sort of um, racial violence against African Americans across the South, that his parents chose to leave for the hopefully um, better opportunities in Philadelphia. Um, next slide, please. Interestingly, Ben Fletcher's father came from the eastern shore of Virginia, um, which is just to the south of the eastern shore of Maryland and, and not so far away really from uh, sort of Philadelphia. Um, you know, the most famous black man of the 19th century was himself worked in the maritime trades on the eastern shore of Maryland. That person was Frederick Douglass, and he had worked in Baltimore in the shipbuilding industry. Um, but then he escaped actually slavery from the eastern shore of Maryland um, using a boat to get up to the state of Delaware and then up to take a train to Philadelphia and then further north, right? Like, and so it's interesting to think about Ben Fletcher. Um, although we know that he was a longshoreman, we don't know what his father did when he lived in Virginia, um, but it's actually not inconceivable that his father was also worked on the waterfront. Um, we also aren't certain but it's very reasonable to conclude that given his parents' birth in the 1850s, that they were born into slavery. Although sadly, um, or unfortunately, um, Ben Fletcher didn't leave any documents that described his, his parents really in any depth. Um, next slide, please. When Fletcher's parents got to Philadelphia in, in, eight, in the late 1880s, and again, Fletcher was born in 1890, um, we know a lot about Philadelphia and the African-American community in Philadelphia in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, in fact, Philadelphia had the largest black population in the United States outside of the South. Um, it wasn't until really the um, World War I era, a little later, that um, New York City and Chicago would later surpass um, uh, Philadelphia for, for the size of its black community. 
Um, W.E.B. Du Bois actually lived in Philadelphia for a while in the 1890s. His first book was about the city of Philadelphia. It was called The Philadelphia Negro. And in that book, he basically said that the heart of the black experience in, 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 in Philadelphia is, is defined by racism. In particular, how black men and black women's job opportunities were narrow because of racism in the city of Philadelphia. Not only was Philadelphia considered to be actually quite racist, relatively better than Virginia, but still pretty bad, um, that it was very anti-union. And so for people, um, I appreciate that I'm speaking to people and hosted by Philadelphians. I know the city well, but not as well as some of you probably. Um, very conservative city, um, very anti-union, which is why one textile worker organizer referred sometimes to Philadelphia as a scab town and another time the graveyard of unionism. Uh, next slide, please. So, Although I feel like I know a great deal about Ben Fletcher and I've shared that as much as possible in, in, in my book um, of the same name, right? There's a lot we don't know about Fletcher. Um, we don't even know, for example, when precisely he joined the IWW, nor sadly why, although we can assume, I think we can make some sort of educated guesses about Fletcher's politics um, subsequently and then read them backwards in time. But I basically suggest that around 1910, possibly 1911 at the latest, Fletcher is a member of the IWW. He also probably joined the Socialist Party of America at that time. And it was common in the um, er, in the first decade of the 1900s and then the early 19 teens for people to be members of both the Socialist Party and the IWW, although later there was a rift um, over uh, essentially strategy. But we know that Fletcher um, is in the IWW. He shows up in the IWW press in 1911, 1912, and then and beyond, um, uh, among other reasons, because he's considered to be a really great speaker. And so, again, for, for people in Philadelphia, for instance, one of the first reports, one of the first examples of Fletcher showing up in the documentary evidence in newspapers um, is speaking in Philadelphia, but also speaking downriver in Chester, right? Um, and so he's um, very quickly being identified as a very um, prominent speaker, yeah, um, sometimes nicknamed a soapboxer, um, because it was not uncommon for um, street speakers to stand on a little wooden box so that they could elevate themselves above the crowd so they could see people and vice versa. I should also note that Ben Fletcher actually was pretty short. And so he, he might have even wanted to use two soapboxes now and then. Um, but nevertheless, we see that Fletcher as a young man, early um, 20s, right, is becoming an activist, is um, joining radical left-wing organizations, is becoming a speaker of somewhat local renown, as also shows up in the national IWW press and even attends the IWW National Convention in 1912 at the age of uh, 22. Um, next slide, please. So the IWW, I appreciate that some of you may know a great deal about the IWW, but I hate to assume uh, that everyone does. And so if we can go back to 1905, just momentarily, um, which is years before Local 8 emerges, right? Uh, so in 1905, uh, the year that the IWW was founded in the city of Chicago, which is where I happen to be speaking to you from, um, 1905 was a time of extreme inequality, right? Uh, corporations totally dominate the economy. There are no governmental regulations. When I say no governmental regulations, I am saying that literally there had never been a regulation passed by the US government to tell a business how to operate, period, right? Um, and so basically corporations do whatever the hell they want. and that included treating its workers however it so wished. Um, this tiny capitalist class um, uh, dominated and had incredible influence within the government, um, which regularly did the, uh, the company's bidding. So for example, um, dispatching local police or even in some cases the United States Army to crush um, unions and strikes. The working class was also very, very weak at this time. The FFL chose to not organize African Americans, chose to not organize women, chose not to organize most immigrants, chose not to organize most unskilled workers, um, and really was only interested in so-called bread and butter unionism for um, highly skilled, generally male, generally white, native-born men. Right? In other words, the AFL chose to or not organize most workers. Right. And so into this huge vacuum, the IWW is created by uh, several hundred radicals, left wing activists, unionists, socialists and the like, who want to create a socialist 
rival to the AF of L. Um, and from their inception, they also very much understand that capitalism being global, that their organization should be as well. And so that's why they took the name, the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, it was actually discussed at their founding convention in Chicago that um, uh, the name was proposed, the Industrial Workers of America, and that was rejected in favor of the, the name that it was ultimately took, the Industrial Workers of the World. A subject I'll talk a little more about. Um, and as I've already, I think, referred to, and as probably a good number of you already know, um, members of the IWW affectionately are called Wobblies. That term emerges early in their history and still is um, the term used widely today. Um, next slide, please. Always love this particular um, poster that some of you probably are familiar with. Um, so the IWW is expressly anti-capitalist, right? Um, and so it's not just in about earning more wages for its members, although I actually very much believe that unions should constantly be fighting to improve their members' wages and conditions in the short term. They're very much also sort of a intentionally radical and revolutionary in their long-term vision. Yeah, um, and so this pyramid of capitalism, which is such a nice, um, well, uh, sort of graphic demonstration basically of how the many are um, exploited by the few, right? Um, Fletcher very much believed in this as well, that the uh, capitalism was inherently unfair and that the working class therefore had to sort of organize ultimately on jobs uh, through unions, but also using um, a worker's greatest power, which is to strike, which another way to think about that is essentially to stop work is putting your hands in your pockets. And as Big Bill Haywood, a famous Wobbly said, you know, the greatest power of workers is simply to put your hands in your pockets, right? Um, the Wobblies also famously organized solidarity. Um, they weren't the first person in or group to use that term by any means, but they very much embrace that concept. Their motto, an injury to one is an injury to all, sort of symbolizes that very much so, and it's been adopted as a phrase by unions around the world um, to this day. Right. Um, and, you know, this is also why the IWW from its birth was anti-racist as well as anti-xenophobic and anti-sexist um, is because um, these sorts of divisions among working class people, race, sex, nationality and others um, only weaken. Uh, and the only ones who ultimately benefit from these divisions are employers, right? And so uh, working class solidarity, um, opposition to employers, what we might call class struggle, right? Um, with a long-term goal of revolutionary change with the embrace of socialism. That was the agenda of the IWW. Uh, next slide, please. Now I highlight the sort of racial and ethnic matters so much um, because they're so central to the story of Ben Fletcher, to Local 8 and the IWW, even, but they're also, for many of us, um, perhaps the reason why they're so interesting to us in the 21st century, where more of us are thinking about these issues in greater depth. The IWW, as I mentioned, condemned racism and sexism and xenophobia and um, mocked the AFL for being um, so divisive among workers, nicknaming the AFL the American separation of labor, among other um, uh, terms. Uh, it's also important to understand that in the city of Philadelphia, which was the third biggest city and the fifth big, biggest port perhaps in that era, um, that the waterfront was incredibly diverse that about a third of the people who worked in loading and unloading ships, um, AKA longshoremen, were African-American, including Ben Fletcher, um, that maybe a third of the dock workforce was Irish and Irish-American, and maybe a third of the waterfront was other European immigrants, think Italians, Poles, Lithuanians, East European Jews, and so on. So in this very ethnically and racially and nationally divided workforce, the AFL ideology doesn't really work very well. Um, by contrast, um, being overtly anti-racist and anti-xenophobic would be obviously attractive to this incredibly diverse workforce, especially if you had an African-American who is leading the charge. And I should also note that Fletcher had a long history already. He had organized as a wobbly leader for several years that most of the people he would have been organizing prior to the Philadelphia waterfront would have probably been European immigrants, right? Um, and so he already had a lot of experience organizing white and immigrant workers as well as black workers. Next slide, please. Um, 
a quick detour into the world of maritime. Um, I appreciate that this week the Suez Canal is all in the news, and so a lot of us are thinking about this. Um, when I and other sort of scholars and activists think about what's happening uh, in the Suez Canal, it's literally a choke point, right? Um, because so much of the world's trade goes through this narrow canal that literally one ship, because it's so massive, um, blocks global trade. Um, I want you to think about this in another way. Um, which is that not only do occasionally accidents happen that result in a big ship get, uh, running aground, I want you to think about workers intentionally stopping work in order to sort of demonstrate their power, in order to promote them their own um, agenda. Now, why is shipping so important? Um, well, we're seeing it again this week, but literally um, European shipping technology, Spanish, Portuguese, and later British and other, um, are the most, um, well, sophisticated ship technology in the world. It is literally the ship that allows European empires to dominate the world for the last 500 plus years. It also simultaneously was the means to sort of spread the economic system that was developing in the early modern era that we know as capitalism, right? And so the European empires simultaneously conquer the world, uh, subjugate peoples around the world, and spread their economic system, which we now call capitalism, right? Um, and we can then sort of bring that back to workers because in the 18th century, the greatest city in the world, the largest, most important port city was London because the British Empire was the largest, and London, is also the biggest port in the world, right? Um, and it was in 1768 that sailors um, take down the sails of their ship in order to press their employer, their ship captain, for a raise. The nautical term for removing the sails is striking the sail. Um, and so the term, the nautical term to basically stop uh, the movement of a ship becomes the de facto word that we all use to describe work stoppages in English, right? Um, and so that also tells us the centrality of maritime or nautical to um, the economy, right? Um, and so that's actually a really cute, yet actually quite meaningful um, little vignette. Next slide, please. So, the, you know, um, in addition to sailors, there's also people who work loading and unloading ships. I, uh, I'm focusing on those folks today, right? Um, historically, they were called longshoremen. You might call them longshore workers if you so wish, or dock workers. I usually often use the term dock worker because it's gender neutral, right? Um, before you even get a job, working on the waterfront, you gotta get hired, right? And in this era around the world, in port cities around the world, um, the system was somewhat similar, um, the hiring process, right? And so in Philadelphia, you'd go down to the Delaware River on the east side of the city, right? To one of the many different piers that stuck out their fingers into the Delaware, right? Um, where there would have been dozens of ships parked, right? Or anchored, and you'd get hired. Right? Um, but what if 200 people show up and there's only 20 jobs? Well, the system of hiring, which was nicknamed the shape up, is inherently beneficial to the bosses and hurts workers. Um, there are huge labor surpluses in cities around the country and the world. Um, as rural peoples move to cities, as immigrants move to cities, um, because the work is relatively unskilled, um, young men like Ben Fletcher could go down to the riverfront and try to get um, a day's work. Right. Um, this system of hiring, however, is deeply exploitative. The bosses can play one group of workers off each other as well as ex um, demanding bribes from people. So empo employees, dock workers hate the shape up. They understand that it's used as a whip to keep them uh, weak um, as well as wages low. Next slide. Once you got hired on the waterfront, the work itself is very physically demanding, um, very dangerous. I've said it many times, but literally any day you walk onto a waterfront in this era, you could die, right? Um, there are any number of ways that you could get injured or be killed on the waterfront. So first and foremost, the work is dangerous. Um, assuming that you live, the work is very hard, right? Um, heavy manual labor in which you often have to carry several hundred pounds on your back, up and down ladders, up in, uh, on ships and off ships. The ship, of course, is constantly moving in good weather and bad, if it's raining, if it's cold, um, if it's day or if it's night. Um, and often the shifts go really long um, because, and this goes back to that last, um, one of the reasons that dock workers have power, the ship must sail on time. Everyone knows the phrase. Another way of thinking about that is another well-known phrase, time is money. In the industry that is transportation, time is money. Every, every hour it takes longer to load or unload a ship is more money that the company is paying for the labor, right? And so everyone knows this, right? Of course, this is another part of their power, but it's another reason that they're worked so hard, right? Like, and so this is the nature of the work. Um, next slide, please. Another last point I'd like to make about the dock work, 
is that the work itself is very collective. No one loads and unloads a ship by themselves. Instead, it very much requires gangs of men to do so and often in pairs, right? And so the nature of the industry, the nature of the work um, inculcates a, 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 an identity among workers that we are workers, we are together. I am not me, we are us. Right? Um, we are a team, we need each other to make sure that we don't die, but we also need each other to make sure that we can load and unload these things relatively easily. Right? Um, and so that's very important to understand that even though ethnically and racially, these workers were often divided, um, the work itself um, was a benefit, you might say, because it fostered this collective identity. Um, next slide, please. So with that sort of lengthy introduction, we can talk about some of the details, right? Um, in the spring of 1913, um, uh, much of the dock workforce in Philadelphia, over 4,000 longshoremen went on strike. Um, it was common in this era, um, this is before workers have the right to strike, the right to unionize, et cetera, um, that basically workers would have to strike to gain union recognition. In the midst of this strike, a union is formed, chartered by the IWW, and that becomes known as Local, local H. The strike was about gaining a union, but also to about gaining a raise. And it's in this moment, essentially, that, uh, well, Local H is born literally. Um, next slide, please. Once in power, Local 8 started to shake things up in a bunch of different ways. Now, I already noted that the IWW was anti-racist and that its leading member in Philadelphia was African-American. It was the bosses that had segregated the gangs. It was the bosses that basically hired black gangs to play against Polish gangs, to play against Irish gangs, to work people faster by using prejudice among workers against them, right? Um, the dock workers union, Local 8, immediately integrated the work gangs. No more black gangs, Polish gangs, and Italian gangs. Now we have multiracial, multi-ethnic gangs. The union also integrated themselves. So in their union meetings, in their leadership posts, in their social events, um, the entire structure of the union is very intentionally um, to sort of integrate the ranks, particularly African-American and white, um, even though many European immigrants may not yet sort of in, even understand whiteness, because that's a concept that one must learn. It is not born into us. It is not genetic. It is socialized, right? And so um, Local 8 will immediately start attacking racism in a very concrete ways um, that prove very effective. And it also, of course, builds more unity among the members themselves. Next slide, please. Not only did uh, Local 8 uh, create integration from below, um, Local 8 also got rid of the shape up, right? So instead of having to go down to the pier every morning to try to find a job, now employers would have to call up the union hall and say, we want some workers to come to our pier at this time uh, to work this ship. And um, then the union will dispatch members, right? Um, and so the shape up is abolished. That's a huge benefit for the workers, right? Um, and then the workers control who basically does the work. How do they do this? Well, um, everyone has to pay a sort of a small, modest monthly dues. Then you get a button, like some of these ones pictured here, right? Um, and then workers know basically who's paid up, who's a member in good standing and who's not, right? Um, the IWW started to use this system. It is not unique to the Philadelphia waterfront, but they basically use this tactic that some other unions used as well. Um, the IWW also on the Philadelphia waterfront started to create new um, events, new celebrations, you might say. And so on the first anniversary of their initial strike. They basically told their bosses, we're not going to work on Saturday because we're going to have a big parade. And the employer said, um, don't do that. You'll be, we're going to fire you if you actually sort of take the day off. And the union took the day off anyway. And thousands of men celebrated along with um, allies, friends, and family, um, had a big parade, had a big party um, at a city park. And then by the evening, the employers are begging the uh, sort of members of the union to come back to work at the night shift, right? Um, and they would continue to celebrate their um, birthday for the next few years with an annual strike. Next slide, please. I do also want to point out that the IWW in general, but that includes Local 8, did not sign contracts with employers because most union contracts, and I should note that I'm in a union, the American Federation of Teachers, most union contracts in the United States have no strike clauses. That means that for the duration of the contract, you promise not to strike. Instead, what Local 8 had was an oral agreement, essentially annual, right? And that prevented employers from baby, being able to force workers to not strike. So employees, dock workers, wobblies, always had the potential power to strike 
Sometimes the threat of a strike is enough, but sometimes you just go on strike anyway. These sorts of sometimes called direct action tactics, sometimes these are also called quick strikes. Um, the truth is that we don't know how many happened, right? They're simply undocumented, right? Um, and so we might guess that they were regular. They, they happened enough that employers basically respected these agreements because they feared the disruptions that these workers in this union were had demonstrated their ability to do, right? Um, and so this is also very much an IWW precept. It's not unique again to the IWW, that where do people have their greatest power? Not at the ballot box, not in political organizations, but on the job and in a union. This is actually one of the major differences, say, between the IWW and, for example, the Socialist Party that also um, shared ideologically a great deal in common with the IWW in this era. Next slide, please. Although I'm primarily talking about Philadelphia, obviously, I uh, sort of just want to make clear, right, that the IWW was constantly thinking globally, right? Not, um, sailors were constantly coming into Philadelphia from other countries. Some of these people were wobbly. Some of them became wobblies. The IWW also exported its ideas through its own members. And so if you were a member of the IWW, you, you would sort of, when you got a job on a ship, you would try to organize your fellow workers, but you also would bring these ideas to other countries. And that's in fact what we see. The IWW had chapters in several dozen other countries around the world, in Europe, in Central America, in South America, in the Caribbean, in Australia, in New Zealand, et cetera, in South Africa. I've written about um, the IWW in South Africa, um, but this is a cool image of the Little Red Songbook in Finnish on the left. I actually really love the photograph on the right. It's from New Zealand um, where um, IWW organized mine workers um, and also the IWW was the first non-indigenous organization to try to organize indigenous workers together. And so in the IWW newspaper in, in, in New Zealand, there was actually a non-Maori person who knew Maori, who wrote a column in Maori for Maori working class people, right? Um, and as an example, in other words, that the IWW was not only anti-racist in the USA, it was anti-racist in South Africa, it was anti-racist in New Zealand, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Philadelphia was Phil Ben Fletcher's home place, uh, but he often was um, sent to other places in, other, in order to organize, he, especially to port cities, from Boston into Providence, uh, Rhode Island, into New York City, down to Baltimore, and down to Norfolk, Virginia. And so Fletcher, because of his um, abilities as an organizer and a speaker, was regularly dispatched to organize and attempt to organize um, wob uh, wobbly locals in other port cities especially. Next slide, please. And it was in Norfolk, Virginia in early 1917, the spring of 1917, which is around the time that the United States declares war in uh, against Germany, um, that Ben Fletcher happens to be in Norfolk, Virginia, where the work dock workers are predominantly black, um, and where he's organizing on the Norfolk waterfront. It is at that time that Fletcher is um, threatened with a lynching um, for his activism. And he actually is smuggled out by friends uh, and sort of escapes to Boston in um, early 1917, where he then lives for actually a number of months organizing. Um, next slide, please. It's while he's in Boston that he's first being spied upon by the US federal agents. The United States had declared war in April of 1917, almost immediately, the United States Department of Justice through something called the Bureau of Investigation that later becomes known as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, at this time it's still part of the DOJ, um, starts to basically survey wobbly leaders around the country, including but not only Ben Fletcher, right? And so we already see, and in my book, uh, much of which is original documents, we see how federal agents are basically spying on Ben Fletcher in May and June of 1917. Um, but like I said, this was happening around the country. And um, in the September of 1917, the federal government issues indictments against hundreds of wobbly leaders, including Ben Fletcher. Um, and then um, basically these uh, uh, many of their leaders, including Ben Fletcher, are then brought to Chicago in the spring of 1917 for a mass trial that will last into the fall of 1918, right? Um, for months where um, Fletcher and um, others are basically um, being accused of espionage and sedition. In other words, treason, um, uh, being punished really for their opposition to the war. 
Um, although Fletcher, um, none of, uh, we have no audio of Ben Fletcher. Some of his jokes are recorded repeatedly um, by Wobblies and by in some newspapers, um, but some of the most well-known of his jokes are sort of come out of this wartime trial, right? And so during the trial, Ben Fletcher turns to his friend, um, the leading defendant, Big Bill Haywood, and says, um, you know, if it wasn't for me, there'd be no color at all in this trial. Um, much of Fletcher's humor really sort of turns on the absurdity of racism, which he's very aware of, right? Um, and uh, and then, you know, later in the trial, after all the defendants are found guilty on all counts, when a jury comes back in under an hour, um, saying everyone's guilty of everything, right? Um, Fletcher again turns to Haywood as the sentences are being read out and Fletcher says to Haywood, um, the judge isn't using very good grammar today. And Haywood says, how's that Ben? And Ben says, well, um, the sentences are much too long. Next slide, please. In fact, Ben Fletcher was found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison and fined $30,000. If you adjust for inflation, we're talking more like $300,000. Um, and everyone in that trial was then soon thereafter sent on a uh, sort of dedicated train to Leavenworth, Kansas um, to be um, begin their long federal prison sentences. Next slide, please. So Leavenworth um, is notorious um, as the first federal prison. Uh, you can imagine there were hundreds of wobblies, communists, anarchists, religious objectors, black army soldiers, um, so quote unquote common criminals. Um, we know about Fletcher's time there, but not so much through him, but through some other people. One of the other famous um, people in Leavenworth is a Mexican revolutionary and anarchist named Ricardo Flores Magón. Magón writes about his time in Leavenworth um, uh, as follows. Um, he was caught by the formidable mechanism of a monstrous machine and my flesh gets ripped open and my bones crushed and my moans fill the space and make the very infinite shudder. But the machine will not stop grinding and grinding and grinding. Um, a friend of mine, Christina Heatherton, who was also an academic, um, nicknamed this the University of Radicalism because there were all these different radicals, including Fletcher, in the mix in Leavenworth in 1919, 1920 or so. Uh, next slide, please. Ironically, we know about um, some of Ben Fletcher's life because the federal government spied on him, as well as other Wabwee prisoners. And so all of his correspondence coming and going was read by um, guards, and then some of these transcribed. And, and, and a lot of these letters are in my book, right? Um, but one letter he wrote to a, a socialist friend of his in Milwaukee on New Year's Eve, 1920. Um, one paragraph was as follows. We are living in momentous times. None of us are gifted with the power of clairvoyancy as to be able to foretell the day or the hour. Therefore, the first and most important duty uh, is for all of us to prepare ourselves for the final chapter in the life of capitalism. Next slide, please. It was during this time um, that uh, even though the Fletcher and five other Philadelphia leaders were imprisoned, that um, Local 8 actually persevered, continued to sort of represent local uh, dock workers, thousands of men throughout the war, even though um, the leaders were imprisoned. Actually, they, they, the government, including the US Navy yards, continued to only hire Wobblies throughout this, uh, this time period, which is evidence of that even though the government hated the Wobblies, they actually weren't strong enough for some reason to sort of defeat them just yet. Um, next slide, please. So, it's in this time period also that the um, early 1920s that ultimately Local 8 will be sort of defeated. Um, it's actually a very complicated story and I spend a chapter in my book, Wobblies on the Waterfront, describing it, although I also describe it in the introduction to this book, Ben Fletcher. Um, but basically shipping companies locked out Local 8 in late 1922. They had incredible support from the city government and the federal government, which basically um, subsidized strike breakers to be brought in from other cities. Um, the rival Avavel Union was happy to exploit this um, opening as well. Rising racism and xenophobia are sort of dividing workers as well as sort of a new challenge on the left, um, the Communist Party, right, um, which emerged after World War I and sort of its arrival on the left. Um, although Fletcher is still considered by um, a radical black newspaper called The Messenger, the most prominent Negro labor leader in America, by 1923, Local 8 no longer has control of the Philadelphia waterfront. Next slide, please. 
It took a few more years, but the AF of L was able to ultimately gain a foothold on the Philadelphia waterfront and chartered a, uh, a local in Philadelphia that now is known as Local 1291 of the International Longshoremen's Association, which is part of the AF of L CIO, then the AF of L. Um, although they were able to secure a union contract, and, and although that union contract guaranteed an hour day, which was a benefit, no doubt, um, the ILA was um, notoriously un or anti democratic. Um, the ILA also was was not anti-racist, it, it included black people, but it didn't treat them equally. And so it allowed segregated gangs to return. Maybe that was even preferable to uh, the white leadership of the ILA. The shape up also returned to the Philadelphia waterfront. Um, the ILA actually was not necessarily anti shape up and we could talk about that if someone wants. Um, so the, a union existed and it continues to exist to this day, but um, you know, it was far less democratic. It was far less useful to African Americans and it was, um, uh, and even the neighborhoods along the riverfront um, supposedly in the late 1920s became less safe for black people to sort of walk around in. Um, the IWW remained anti-racist as this sort of amazing poster from the early 1920s um, reveals, um, but they no longer controlled the Philadelphia waterfront. Uh, next slide, please. Sometime around 1930, 31, Ben Fletcher moved to um, New York City. Why? Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, he was an IWW organizer in the early 30s, um, but in the mid-30s, just when he's around the age of 45, 44, he has a, a major stroke. He also, in his letters, complains about other health problems. And so really, for his final 15 years of life, um, he's not very strong and he's not an activist, even though he's still friends and surrounds himself with wobblies and anarchists in um, Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, Fletcher will die in 1949 um, in, uh, well at home in Brooklyn and he lived in the Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood, which at that time was not as sort of predominantly black as it later became. Uh, and he's buried in Brooklyn in an unmarked grave although um, I've sort of brought together some different people, including Wobblies in New York City and other places, to try to um, change that by um, raising funds for a significant marker or some other sort of monument for him in, in the cemetery in Brooklyn. We also very much want to sort of do something in the city of Philadelphia, and so I appreciate that this audience is Philadelphians. And so I'd love to see a big mural in South Philly near the riverfront um, in honor of Local 8 and featuring Ben Fletcher, but maybe some people in this group will be um, willing to join me and help lead that effort. Um, next slide, please. To conclude, um, you know, as this Atlanta Daily World um, quote uh, sort of indicates, uh, he was one of the most brilliant Negroes ever associated with a leftist organization. The Atlanta Daily Word was a black newspaper in Atlanta and a conservative black newspaper. And uh, so it's interesting that that they um, sort of his, his obituary was sort of so positive. Um, I do apologize for the formatting of this. I have no idea why the formatting of my slideshow has been sort of butchered um, using this sort of particular um, platform, but nevertheless, I'm mindful of that. My apologies. Um, you know, Fletcher, though, was sort of when he died, was sort of hailed as a hero by um, not only Wobbies, but other leftists. Um, he was sort of remained committed to sort of revolutionary unionism and socialism until his dying days. Um, he um, very much believed that unions had to um, fight racism. Um, but he um, didn't sort of give primacy to race. He really was um, a believer that multiracial unionism as opposed to black, exclusively black unions were the sort of the path forward. Um, he, no one had to explain to him America was a racist place. He was a victim of racism. Um, but nevertheless, he very much believed in this sort of um, multiracial, multiethnic vision that sort of was sort of why he joined the IWW in the, when he was a young man and why he remained a wobbly to his dying days. Next slide, please. I very much appreciate everyone's attention and I hope that um, uh, Y'all sort of have some good comments and questions for me. Thank you so much again, and thanks to the Philly Socialists for hosting me. First, I want to say thanks so much for your uh, presentation, Dr. Cole. Um, really informative. 
Uh, great stuff. And I mean, personally, um, my speaking on behalf of myself, and I'm sure as a lot of other people viewing, um, I had no idea who Ben Fletcher was uh, prior to this, um, but definitely some really impressive accomplishments. And I guess uh, I had a question. I wanted to kick off our questions here before we open the floor for everybody else so that they can take some time to process and, and come up with what questions they might have. Um, my question for you, and kind of a loaded one, is um, considering that uh, just kind of in the, the labor market today, the social dynamic, the technological dynamic uh, has changed so greatly from Ben Fletcher's times. How do you think that like we here in, in Philadelphia and in fact, like in the rest of the country and the rest of the world can apply the the lessons that Ben Fletcher taught us into organizing today. Well, Ezra, that's a great question. It's a small question, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, I am no expert on labor union organizing, although I like think that I have some opinions. I mean, the first thing I say is, as much as things change, not everything has changed. In fact, of course, the bosses are still the bosses, and we're still the workers. But also, you know casual labor, so-called day labor, still exists. I have no doubt that in the city of Philadelphia on a daily basis, there are people who are picked up and sort of hired by the hour or by the day, maybe in domestic work, maybe in some sort of other sorts of, um, you know, labor. And so like, you know, and, and around the world, because I appreciate that this is a global conversation, you know, in South Africa, the country I know best in the developing world, the so-called informal economy is larger than the formal economy, right? Like, uh, which means that there's a, the majority of people who are working are actually working in this sort of unstructured, unregulated market, right? Like uh, who are in, uh, often hired in very short sort of periods of time by the day, by the hour, by the week, right? Like, and so I will address your question, but like actually not everything has changed for billions of workers. Things are very similar to what Philadelphia was like in 1912, right? Like, uh, um, for better or worse, my opinion, the worse, right? Like as for um, how we organize today, I think the another um, uh, lesson, yeah, might be that we think about organizing the unorganized, another sort of popular wobbly motto, right? Like, so sadly, the United States labor movement has been sort of on its back um, for decades, right? Like uh, now there's a lot of reasons for that, right? And maybe most of it is, due to the bosses and the government, but there's also blame to be had within the labor movement, right? Like, a, and, you know, it's amazing that unions, some unions today continue to sort of refuse to organize some people because of their race or sex, but more commonly because of their, the type of work they do, right? And the idea that some people are unorganizable because they work part-time, because they work in low-wage jobs, right? Those are just mistakes, huge mistakes, right? Mistakes that have been repeated for decades, right? Like, uh, and so if we're thinking about this, the point is, is that like, we need to be going after all these people. 90% of American workers are in the units, right? There's plenty of growth potential, <laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, so therefore, you could literally pick an industry and there's the odds are there's no union in it, right? Um, and start organizing. But like, so we're, I think that's another lesson is that we need to sort of uh, refuse to accept that these workers, because of the sorts of work they do, can't be organized, right? That's sort of defeating ourselves before we even have a chance to win, right? Like, um, and so those are two or three um, points, I guess, off of your question, which is, a great question, like I said, but enormous. Um, hopefully some other people will ask questions that are similar and then we could circle back. Peter, I have a question. I was wondering if you, um, if there are any reasons you found in your research for why Ben Fletcher is kind of not as well known, this sort of like hidden figure, when at the time he was such a, a huge like union figure? So Caitlin, that's also a great question and it's one I have thought about, but you know, the, the, the flippant answer is that, we, you know, as historians, we can't know what didn't happen, right? Like, uh, and so it's just, um, these are called counterfactuals. Why is Fletcher not famous, right? Like, I have opinions and so I'll offer a few, right? Like, uh, but in a way it's like, your guess is as good as mine, right? Like, I mean, so the short version of course is that, you know, as Utah, Phillips, uh, you know, the great wobbly singer used to say, 
when we're taught in school, we're taught the, 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 the history of the ruling class. Right? Um, we're not taught the history of the working class. We never have been, right? Like people who are knowledgeable, like in that game at the beginning of it, who know the answers to those sort of icebreaker questions are people who have educated themselves or been educated in some way outside of our normal school system, right? Because the system is designed to preserve the status quo. Right, that's every country. That's not just our country, right? And so the fact that we don't learn about this stuff that Ezra and you are unfamiliar with Ben Fletcher, I know that, right? That's that's a sad reality, right? Like, uh, and so why is because if we knew this stuff, it might empower us to sort of challenge the system and more directly, right? Like, so that's the sort of the big ideological answer, right? Like. Um, the more particulars are, you know, the Wobblies actually were effectively destroyed, even though they didn't disappear entirely, right? And then other left organizations ascended, in particular in the U.S., but in many other countries in the 20s and 30s. The communists, the communists and the Wobblies were rivals, but they also were sort of bitter rivals, right? Partially, in my opinion, because the communists really essentially wanted to wipe out the Wobblies because they wanted to essentially take over the left. Um, this happened in many countries, not just the USA, right? Like, uh, so for example, in South Africa, again, a c the country I know best outside of the US, the Communist Party is actually still an important but small force. They claim that they're the first organization to organize multiracially. That's actually a lie. The IWW organized in South Africa before this Communist Party existed before the Soviet revolution occurred, right? Like, uh, but that has been sort of disappeared. It's not a conspiracy per se, right? But it's because in that country, the communists who have enough Jews are able to basically control the narrative, right? Like uh, this is the genius of George Orwell that we all rediscovered during the Trump era, right? Is that, um, you know, if you control, if, if, let's the Orwell quote, if, uh, to, uh, to control the present is to control the past and to control the past is to control the future. That's a paraphrase, right? Like, a, but that's why history matters, right? And of course I'm a history professor, right? Um, but uh, you know, if we don't know this, others will basically exploit our knowledge or ignorance, right? And so it's not unique to the story of Ben Fletcher. There's many other important aspects of our history, um, US and global that we need to know in my opinion but we've been disempowered, right? Like, uh, and so this sort of educational work is not fast or glamorous, but it's necessary in order to take us to the next levels, right? Like we need awareness, right? Like, uh, and so um, Fletcher himself is less the important than the bigger picture, right? But Fletcher's disappearance, I think is because not very few people know about the Wobblies either, right? Like, uh, so that's sort of part and parcel. We actually had somewhat of a related question come up. Someone asked, um, quite a few Wobblies joined the Communist Party, like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Why didn't um, Bill, uh, Ben Fletcher join? So that's a great question. Um, so in the United States and in other countries, when the Soviet Union is born, people all over the world who are socialists are thrilled. Right, like um, that includes the Wobblies. So if you look at the IWW press in 1917, 1918, 1919, they're generally effusive in their praise for the Soviet Union. Right, like this is the start of something new and exciting and the future. Right, like this is what, in a way, we've been dreaming. Many Wobblies, as this um, questioner asked, right, like um, joined this, the communists in the U.S. or other countries. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is one example. She became one of the most important leaders of the CPUSA. Um, another example is Big Bill Haywood. Of course, it was more controversial because he jumped bail and therefore basically the Wobblies who put up all this money <laughs> for him, he sort of fled to the Soviet Union because he didn't want to go back to Leavenworth, right? Um, uh, but he also is another important US IWW. Why did Fletcher? So this is sort of hopefully not too much in the weeds, right? Um, and it's talked a lot about in my book on Ben Fletcher, but also in my book, While He's on the Waterfront. But in 1920, the uh, Local 8 was accused of loading weapons for the counter-revolutionaries in the Soviet Union, right? Like the so-called whites, right? Um, and these military supplies ostensibly were gonna be loaded to sort of help overthrow. The US government was anti-Soviet already. Uh, and so this claim, this assertion, quickly results in the suspension of Local 8 from the IWW, okay? Now, the IWW in Philadelphia, including Ben Fletcher, said we did not load weapons for the whites, okay? I should say, having researched this, but mindful that there's a lot I do not know, there's no evidence 
right? There was an assertion, right? Um, but the IWW quickly suspended. Ultimately, Local 8 was brought back into um, the IWW. It becomes even more complicated. This becomes known as the Philadelphia controversy. But I have written about this, well, more than anyone in the world, right? And basically, um, this is why would this charge be leveled? Some of these wobblies in New York, who where the, the, the basically the Maritime Union's headquarters was, had leveled this charge because they wanted to capture the IWW for the CP, which was in fact the global Soviet intention. We want the IWW to join, essentially the so the Communist International, right? Um, the IWW, however, was hesitant, right? Even though, despite their initial sort of excitement, um, and when the IWW refused to join the CP in the US or in the Communist International. This is, a, uh, this is basically uh, sort of dis unproven, right? Like uh, this communist ordered the disruption of local aid, right? And sort of basically sent this disinformation to undermine the IWW in their strongest place, right? Um, and when I say this, I'm speaking Ben Fletcher. So why did not Ben Fletcher join the communists? Because he and many wobblies believed that this was a communist plot, right, as crazy as this may seem, right, uh, to um, destroy the IWW's most powerful local. And therefore, um, uh, why would Fletcher never become a communist? It's because the communists had essentially used this in order to undermine the IWW, its most important U.S. left-wing rival, right? Um, so whether or not that's, tr whether or not the communists actually tried to do this, Ben Fletcher believed it. Ben Fletcher, of course, was there and I wasn't. And so like, um, it's not entirely an unfair claim on his part, right? Like, uh, um, the last thing I'll say about this is that the Soviet, uh, you know, in fact, the US was arming the whites out of Seattle. And there is a documented case of Seattle longshoremen discovering weapons, refusing to load those weapons. And since the whites were being armed out of Siberia, it would have been illogical to sort of arm them from an Atlantic port when you had to sail all the way around um, to the Pacific. And so it, that the, the claim that they were loading weapons for the whites, it's possible. I can't say it didn't happen, right? Like, uh, but it's illogical geographically, right? And we have this proof that in fact, they, the US was arming people out of the West Coast, which is more logical, right? Like, uh, and so there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, right? Um, but it's, it's uncertain. I've tried and I looked and the, the evidence is minimal, right? Like, uh, that's hopefully not too, like I said, in the weeds, but like this rift between the IWW and the communists was echoed in other sort of anarchistic and syndicalist uh, like organizations around the world, because these debates were happening in many countries in the early 1920s. But ultimately the IWW came to believe that Soviet Union was authoritarian, right? That this sort of one party system was anti-democratic and, 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 and essentially a false approach. History might say that that's not entirely wrong uh, about given the sort of the rise of Stalin, and, but even during the era of Lenin, as some of us may know, like the most well-known example is Kronstadt, right? Where basically left opponents of the Soviet regime were killed by the Soviet regime. Was that necessary? Maybe, right? In a revolutionary moment. Um, but there's very particular reasons why the Wobblies generally and why Ben Fletcher specifically did not want to join the communists, right? Like, uh, even if they both shared this deep vision of socialism, right? Like, they disagreed deeply on tactics, but also on process, right? Like, uh, in ways that divided. Sadly, these sorts of divisions have hurt the left, yeah, um, in many countries, right? So the sectarianism of the left is a problem. How do we overcome that? That's a great, an important matter, right? Um, but in Fletcher's time, it was not resolved, right? And the communists rose as a force and the Wobblies declined, right? That's clearly what occurred, right? Like whether, why it happened is a, you could debate. Thank you. All right, we can, and that's a great point about the, the sectarianism and uh, the fact that that is, that is a huge hurdle to overcome for the left. Um, we'll take another question. Uh, we've got, how can we get people to refuse to work for an employer that employs only non-union workers? Well, that's a good question, seeing that almost all of us fit into that category. <laughs> you know, like, uh, um, so, I don't know if I have a great answer to that. I think if I could sort of slightly, uh, to answer a slightly different question would be, how do you convince workers 
in a non-union workplace to sort of start considering joining a union, right? Like, I mean, um, because rather than sort of being unemployed, which means that you're not getting paid, better would be to sort of be able to organize your workplace, right? That's my opinion, right? Like, uh, and so convincing people to not work at a, un a non-union place quickly, the number of op options diminish, right? I mean, because the reality in the U.S. is that again, about 90% of us don't work in union workplaces. Um, and so if the choice is starving or working in a non-union shop, well, we, we're all gonna choose to eat. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's an important question, but I think the better question in my opinion is like, how do we start to organize our non-union places, right? Like, and those happen really in one-on-one -on -one conversations Right, like, and they're they're better when they come from fellow workers as opposed to an outside union organizer, um, because people who are working together have more deep connections. They might probably have more trust, right? Um, and if a, if if someone's a good worker, which is to say that they have the respect of their fellow workers, they don't kiss the boss's butts, but at the same time, they don't necessarily um, they know the work, right? Like, I'm not anti quality of work, right? Like, uh, and so that sort of respect that someone has on the job will command respect of their fellow workers is my point. If that person is the person who's then saying, we need a union, that will sort of, I think, have a, be more welcome um, by their coworkers than by someone who's waiting at the door of the, the plant or the, the office, waiting for them to come out and talk to them at the end of the shift. Right? Like, uh, and so um, to use this sort of example of what's happening down in Bessemer, Alabama, right? Like that was initially driven by workers who asked for a union. Now there are these union organizers who are coming in, which is actually, I think, well and good. But like the key is that you have to have support on the inside, right? It's not going to happen if it's just outsiders saying you need a union. It's we need a union, right? Like, uh, um, but I think to sort of the last thing I say to that question is, of course, there are some employers that are just so horrible that we should try to convince people not to work for them. Um, but that can be a tough sell depending on the the needs of unemployed people and depending on actually the, the, the wages of the workplace, right? Like I always joke that I have many friends who are lawyers, right? Like they generally hate their work, but they do their work because they get paid well, right? Like, uh, and so we can't ignore the reality, right? Um, that we live in, which is money is a powerful force, right? Like uh, um, it's just unfairly distributed, right? Like, and so how do we um, change that? I do agree with Fletcher and the Wobblies and many, many others that unionism is a one important part of that, right? Like, uh, um, so I, I guess the question, the answer would be, we need more people organizing for themselves within their own workplaces. And that means having these conversations one-on-one -on -one or small groups to try to sort of build that trust, right? Um, Cause there's a lot of fear and about unions because employers hate them. <laughs> and actually workers get fired for wanting to be in a union. Uh, so I think we have time for one more question. Someone was wondering if um, Ben Fletcher worked with any other IWW locals like in the area in Philadelphia. So that's a good question. So before Local Aid existed, um, and uh, the, he was a, a member and a leader in what was called Local 57, which um, you know, the IWW model, which I'm not necessarily saying is the perfect model by any means, <laughs> right? Um, but Local 50, so, so, so the IWW model, and it's, they still do this, as you may know, right? Where there's not enough workers in a particular industry or business to, to basically be a industry specific local, they have a um, what they call a mixed local. Now it's called general membership branch, right? And so people who want to be in the IWW, but they don't have, maybe they're the only one in their workplace or their industry, but that there's a local that exists. It's sort of an umbrella, right? At the city level, right? To sort of bring together people who share these values, right? Like, um, and so he was in local 57 before there was a local eight, right? Um, before the Philadelphia dock workers formed a very large, powerful, branch, right? Um, outside of Philadelphia, he often um, was recruited by other Wobblies to sort of talk about organizing dock workers. So the documentation of where he shows up to speak are generally port cities on the Atlantic coast, right? Like Baltimore, which was the rival port in the mid-Atlantic of Philadelphia. Now Baltimore is not a big port, but it's much bigger than Philly. It's 100 miles closer to the Atlantic than Philadelphia, a river port actually in the days of our huge ships. It's like Philadelphia will never be a massive port the way it was before containerization, right? Like, uh, and so 
Um, Norfolk, that's why I mentioned Providence. He often was also asked to where there were black workers, right? Um, so it's not surprising, right? Um, who, who do we get to recruit black dock workers in, 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 in Providence, Rhode Island, where there was a lot of people of African descent from the Azores and Canaries, these Portuguese island colonies, right? Well, send Fletcher, right? Like here we've got an African-American, different but similar, right? Um, to the sort of the black Portuguese that actually were a major part of the um, workforce in Rhode Island and Southern New England, right? Like, uh, and so he often sort of did these circuits, right? Like um, later in the twenties, he goes on a speaking tour in like uh, the Detroit and then in Ontario. As far as I know, that's the one time he leaves the country. Um, it wouldn't surprise actually if he did give speeches in many other cities, but the documentation is um, often non-existent. Um, we also show him in my book talks a lot about like when he lived in New York in the thirties, right? He shows up at sort of events where he's speaking, for example, on the um, Harlan miners in, from Kentucky, right? To the, the Harlan County mine war that sort of which side are you on is the song that emerges out of that struggle, right? Like where there's a big event at Irving Plaza, which is better known as a concert venue in New York City and Fletcher is one of the speakers, right? Like, uh, um, and so that's interesting to sort of, it's tantalizing, right? Because for every piece of evidence, I guess that there's two, five, 10 other instances where he probably did these sorts of things, right? We just don't have the um, physical evidence to prove his whole life, right? <laughs> you know, his, he didn't keep a journal. Um, uh, there's no records of his sort of doing any uh, correspondence. And so, um, yeah, so he definitely the East Coast, right? Um, whether, he, I don't even know if he ever got west of Chicago, right? Like, uh, which is where he would attend at least a few national conventions of the IWW. Well, thank you so much for joining us and giving this presentation. That was really interesting and really great to hear about, you know, someone from Philadelphia who is so important to the IWW and nationwide organizing. Um, and for anyone who hasn't read the book, have it here. <laughs> it's like the second edition. So um, there's able to be a lot more information. Peter's done a ton more research since the first edition. And the really cool thing about it is that it starts out with like the uh, sort of biography of Ben Fletcher, but then you get these sort of, uh, you know, original source, a ton of different original source material in the back. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, it was great having you. <laughs> It was my pleasure. I appreciate that these sorts of events require a lot of work on the part of people who are on the backside, including you two. Um, and so thank you too, and as well as your organization, Philly Socialists, is an honor to sort of, uh, Ben Fletcher would be proud, right, of all of us for sort of spending this afternoon thinking a little about his life um, and thinking about the future, right, um, which is really what this is about, right? Like as much as we're interested in the past, we're really interested in sort of making a better future. And Fletcher, mm -hmm died believing that too. So thank all of you for your attention and presence. Thanks.